Okay, so the focus of my talk is what I learned while launching our new, newest product line at DIA, while also launching as a new team member. So my name is Rachel Lohnfeld. I'm a senior product designer at DIA & Co. And I've been a designer for about nine years now, and I still think it's the best job ever. So a little bit about DIA & Co. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with services like Stitch Fix or Trunk Club, um, but DIA & Co. has a similar business model. Um, we are a personalized retail services for women who wear sizes 14 and up. Um, our consumers come onto our website, they take an onboarding survey where they fill out their style preferences, their fit preferences, and then using that, um, a combination of our stylist and our data in the algorithm, um, we'll send her a personalized box and she's free to keep what she likes and send back what she doesn't. Um, so. Before launch, our primary offering was anywhere from casual to formal, uh, ready wear clothing, um, but we wanted to launch active wear. Um, as everyone knows, athleisure is super in right now. Also, um, the primary reason of doing this was we wanted to expand our market, and we also wanted to expand our offerings uh, for our current customers, um, provide her with a more robust offering, as well as potentially attract uh, new consumers to our service. So I was also super new, like two months new. <laughs> um, and here I was going to launch this brand new product line. Um, very exciting uh, for both, both Dia and me. Um, so who was involved in the launch? Um, the short answer is <laughs> um, So I've primarily worked in digital product, but Dia and Co. is very much built on not only our digital product, but our physical product, as in our clothing. Um, our operations team, our warehouses. Um, so it was quite an extensive launch in terms of different areas and segments of the business that all had to be working together. But in terms of digital product, our product teams are split amongst three pods. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the consumer pod, which is my pod. Um, these are my BFFs. Um, and we were the people working on all the consumer facing design for our new active line. So when did this all have to happen by? So we had about four-ish months um, from start to finish, although there were other conversations before I came on board um, validating that our users did indeed want Active Line and that there was a market uh, for this type of offering. So in terms of deadline, we had a very strong deadline of May 21st. Um, come hell or high water, we absolutely had to make this. Um, we had bought media, we had a PR push, um, we had a ton of sports bras and leggings that we had purchased and were ready to ship out by this date. Um, you can see here, there's a print ad that we ran um, on our launch day. How are we going to get everything in order uh, to get our, our, every, our launch ready for our launch? Well, I'm sure there's a lot of designers in the audience, and this is a pretty classical design process that we've all followed or have heard about or read about, you know, starting with high-level user flows, going into wireframes, then building prototypes, maybe several prototypes, iterating, building, and then finally rolling out with polished UI design. That is not what we did. Um, not at all. <laughs> we actually started with number four, so starting with what is normally the end of the process, right away with polished UI designs. Um, sorry, wireframes, no time for you. And then we moved on to user flows, and then we finished with user testing. So kind of an unusual process, but um, throughout this talk, I'll explain why and how we kind of made it work for us. So why would we do this? Why did we start with polished UI design, something that is typically reserved for sort of the final stages of a project? Uh, photo shoot um, was the, one of the main drivers. So our creative and marketing team had planned this really cool campaign and this like this whole rollout of ads that they were going to run and all this photography they were going to use to support the marketing campaign. But I really wanted to use this as an opportunity to get some photography for our product work. And I thought, it's fashion. Like, we should have big, beautiful images in all sides of the experience. Like, we should show women feeling fabulous, looking fabulous. Like, it's our new active line. We've got to make a splash. Um, and then the other thing was the, the look and feel of Dia. What was Dia's brand? What was the style guide for our product design work? Um, there had been some initial work done, but there wasn't a strong brand. There wasn't a rigid style guide. 
And for our launch, I really wanted to make sure, as I said before, everything felt really fabulous. Um, so here are some examples of what I was working off of. And these are from our style offering, so the onboarding style survey. So you can see sort of V1, um, very straightforward. V2, we start to add color, sort of elevating the UI a little bit. Um, and this work really set me up to succeed because not only was there a great um, code base to build off of, but uh, a lot of learnings had garnered from this work. A lot of user testing had been done. We had a lot of data about how people interacted with this survey and how they wanted to interact. So here's where I'm starting from. Where do I go? So I didn't want to do no changes, right? Because I had just joined the team. I wanted to show everybody what I could do. This is a big launch. Like, we got to make a splash. Um, but I also didn't want to do a rebrand. <laughs> So I didn't want to attempt to do two really hard things at once and end up delivering nothing. Um, so it was really important uh, that I take the middle or happy path. Um, so I delivered something that I still felt was elevating the brand forward, pushing us further um, towards you know, a better brand, but also our engineers could build on time and we could make our deadline. So the key learning here is set your intention before you start designing. And I was very transparent with my team about where we had been, where we had pushed, where we had flexibility to push the design further, and things that were rigid and would be you know, technically very hard to challenge. So by having those transparent uh, conversations with team members, I really understood where that middle point was. So here are some initial designs. So you can see kind of there's the no changes, and then there's our happy middle way. So we're working with the UI, um, but still adding additional UI elements and kind of bending and flexing, um, introducing some of that photography. I was so excited to get in our new experience. Um, and that image is just FPO. Um, so I took this initial polished UI screens and I presented uh, a rough prototype to our, well, actually, a highly polished UI prototype uh, to our engineering team, and they were super jazzed. Um, it was kind of right in that point of, you know, no one wanted to just do the easy thing. This was our big launch. Um, but we also wanted to make our deadline. So they were excited because, like, this was totally buildable. And because the UI designs were so polished and things were so tight, they could spec it exactly. And that's a screenshot of Pivotal Tracker if there's any engineers in the audience. Um, so they were able to really scope it um, and really estimate it really closely. Um, so learning here, if in a small team, your process has to be flexible. Um, it has to change and shift to fit the needs of what you're delivering and who you're delivering it with, too, right? Um, but when you're designing, do you? So my, my team process wasn't necessarily the process I had for myself, right? So I know I said I skipped the wireframe. I didn't do the user flows. But I did kind of do the user flows, but I did them for myself. Um, and I don't know if anyone here is just starting out or new to design, but I think there's a lot of, you know, great books to read about design process. You can learn a lot about design process from the different places you'll work. But something to kind of make a mental note is, is what works for you? How do you set yourself up for success? And that's kind of quirky. You know, I have my own design process, and that doesn't change no matter where I work or what problem um, I'm trying to solve. So it's kind of like my design stationery. So just like as you go throughout your career, just try to make notes of like those things you do that make you feel creative, relaxed, and ready to take on a challenge. And just try to recreate that mind space when you open up your sketch file or your sketchbook at the start of a project. So here are our designs. So we're very much in the polished UI. And I wanted to point out how, how much placeholder images have been put in place. Um, every image that I had throughout the designs, I found something similar on the internet. I brought it into Photoshop. I Photoshopped it to get it even closer to what I wanted um, within an inch of its life. <laughs> and the reason uh, for so much Photoshop and photo editing um, was I was meeting with the creative and marketing team, and I wanted to provide them explicit detail for what I needed from them. So this is not very sexy, but it's a Google Sheets document, and it lists out every images every image that we need, the ratio for those image, casting notes. Um, what this allowed was for them to not only budget, allowed them for them to cast, um, it allowed for them to make uh, adequate time and preparation so that we could get everything we needed uh, and all those photo assets in a line before the launch. 
Um, and I also provided uh, a PDF where I went even more detailed specific for each photo, um, maybe a little crazy specific. Um, so the learning here is document your project with the right tools for each audience. So for my pod, talk, Slack, email, we're talking every day, like we sit next to each other, um, informal and often uh, is the way to go, but for everyone else, um, editable shared documents. Um, especially when you're new to a company, you may not always know the correct person to share with, uh, especially when you, you know, you're trying to figure out your team um, and then learning the dynamics of other teams is a whole undertaking. So if you try to share with as many people as possible, even if you don't end up sharing with the right person, someone will pass it on, right? So these kind of uh, shared editable documents are really powerful, especially when you have a tight timeline and things are changing really quickly. Okay, so now on to user flows. So it was a team effort. Uh, we had a lot of stakeholders involved, so it was myself, uh, product leadership, uh, very senior data and tech leadership. And we went through a few iterations, and I've structured this as if this was the second step, but this is really happening somewhat simultaneously uh, with the UI design work. And the learning here was obviously Oh, and we got there, so don't worry. We, we didn't launch without a user flow. Um, but the learning there is uh, you're there to crush it. Obviously, you were brought onto the team because everyone believes in you. Uh, you were brought on for your expertise. But you're also there to learn from your team. So especially as a new employee, uh, your coworkers have depth of knowledge and subject matter expertise uh, that you don't have as a new hire. And also, Remember, you took this job because you want to learn from really smart, talented people. So like, don't miss that opportunity. And when you're working collaboratively with your team members, it's actually a real gift because you get to learn from some really talented folks. OK, so user testing. We're almost there. We're going to make our launch. Um, wait, we did a rebrand. No, we didn't. Um, <laughs> that's, not our, that's not our logo. Uh, our launch was super secret, so we put a fake logo up and did some uh, initial prototype user testing. Um, and we got some great uh, improvements from it. Uh, we changed some of the wording of our questions. We actually added a new color question, um, which is really interesting when you have a service like Dia. So we actually knew what colors she liked. Uh, she didn't have to tell us um, from just from the data we could scrub from her answers to other questions. But as from the user's perspective, she doesn't know that. And it's really important for her that she feels heard and she feels confident that the box we're going to be sending her uh, really represents her preferences. So we added a color question so she could feel heard. And also, it was, it was fun to design. Um, so what was the benefit of this really high polish, uh, heavy touch UI design work? So you can see here, here's the comp, and here's what we ended up shooting. Um, as well, this is just two of our screens, but we got very close uh, to what we had specified. Um, even you can see the tennis racket. And it was really great because when it came time to lunch, no one was surprised by the work that was going out. And I feel like the photo composites I made um, set much more of a clear North Star than me describing what I had envisioned or trying to write up what I needed uh, ever could have. So we were nearing our deadline. We had about like a week and a half to go. We were getting in that crunch, si crunch time. There was like a palatable excitement around the office. Um, tick, 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 tock. Um, and our pod expanded. <laughs> and this was actually a really fun part of the, of the process because we got we absorbed to encompass more of our engineering team. And this is always part of the plan. Um, my friend and colleague is here tonight, helped me out, so design. Plus one, there's only four designers at DIA, so now we had 50% of the design team working on active. Um, yeah, and it was really good, because like even the people who were not directly working on it were very much cheering us on. And we launched. We made a bunch of awesome design work. <laughs> this is not even half of the designs we ended up shipping. And it was, ever, it was great. It was happily ever after. Everyone was stoked. Um, here's the team the day of our launch. Well, it's not the full team, but everyone who came dressed up in their active wear. Um, yeah. So I want to end with come join us. Um, we're building tons of awesome stuff, um, and you should come build it with us, especially if you're a designer or engineer. Seriously, um, come talk to me afterwards.
But yeah, thanks. And then just Q&A, I, I just wanted to put up my, my key points if anyone had any questions. Rachel, thank you. Um, I think I saw a question up front. Oh. Thanks, Rachel. That was really great to hear. Um, it seems like everything went really smoothly, and I'm curious, coming into a new place as a new designer um, and launching a new product, were there any hurdles along the way? Like, what were some of your struggles? Um, good question. <laughs> um, yeah, I, it, was, it was a little rocky near the end. Um, I think... My, like, my real struggle was asking for help and not feeling shy about it. Because, you know, when you're new, you want to be like, I'm awesome. I got this. Um, and it's kind of humbling to ask for help. So I think that was my one struggle when we got to that final week, being like, you know what? I need to, I need to bring in another, another pal. And I'm so glad I did, because not only did we like, work really well together, but I ended up learning from that person. And it was, like, it was double awesome. Uh, hi, I'm also a, a designer, so I'm wondering if there were no time limitations, would you still use uh, a, a not normal way to design this process? Um, if there were no time limitations, I would not have worked this way. <laughs> <laughs> um, it worked out, but it is, it is kind of a difficult way to almost sort of work backwards. So. But oftentimes, uh, you know, we don't get our ideal scenario. Simple. Would you do it again? Would I, yeah, it was super fun. <laughs> uh, question for me, what, is, what does the DIA team look for in a designer? What are the competencies you interview for? Ooh, good question. Um, I think, first and foremost, we look for culture. So. And I guess I should have linked into this when you asked me about, um, like, would I do it again? And, like, part of the reason I would do it again and it was super fun was, like, everyone is super supportive and super generous with, you know, the skill sets and knowledge they have. And we really do learn from each other. Um, there are people on the team that have skill sets, um, much more depth of knowledge in areas that I don't have. Um, and it's really uh, wonderful to work with them because we kind of do a knowledge there. So I would say like collaboration and uh, that kind of mindset of generosity mindset with uh, sharing skill sets. And then I'd say the other one would be to be able to be um, really thoughtful about every design decision you make. Um, just because our, our product is so complex um, and you affect so many teams by the design decisions you make, um, we have to be really thoughtful, considered, and also communicate very clearly um, our intention. Awesome. And uh, probably time for one more question. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine, a UX uh, student. Well, we're all in the same class learning about oh, it. Cool. Awesome. Welcome. <laughs> just wanted to ask a little bit about your, the research methodology you put into your mm -hmm. designs and where you got that from. Oh, okay. Yeah, sure. Um, we built, uh, I, I'll just give you a little bit of a technical answer. Yeah, um, but what we did is I built a full prototype uh, using Envision, and then we used uh, usertesting.com, um, which is a really great platform where we were able to have users answer or a series of questions and also kind of talk through their process um, as they were taking it. But that process is still ongoing, and since we're post-launch, um, we're still doing user interviews with people to see, you know, what they think of it, you know, because they're always improving. Cool. Rachel, thank you so much. That was cool. terrific.